to just talk on a few things, and much of this has emerged from the conversation we had during the last session, um, and a lot of it will be uh, generative in terms of discussion and collaboration. So um, Leanne's already obviously welcomed us, and we've had a little chat about pages. We're just going to talk about um, sort of generative approaches and enduring student learning and the relationship there. Uh, we're going to just return to pages as sort of a tool um, and then we'd like to chat a little bit about trauma-informed pedagogy and then share some strategies for student-led learning uh, and tools in Sakai. Um, and then hopefully there's a few minutes to talk about what we'd like to do in, in the next session as well. Um, so we've put together some objectives for sort of this session um, and these are based around the themes of discussion that were in session one. So really about um, you know, how we can encourage students to take sort of leadership and ownership in their learning and how that connects with enduring student learning. Um, Abra brought up the wonderful um, concern around student-centered learning and trauma-informed teaching. Um, and then of course, some, some strategies and tools in Sakai uh, to support that engagement and community. Lovely, thank you. <clears throat> so, I have to um, be honest here, if you talk to anybody who works with me, they'll say I, I can be a little bit annoying over a few things. And one of them is around generation or generative learning. Because on the one hand, we know that examples <clears throat> are really important. But often, if you can ask students to generate any kind of answer before giving them specific and detailed information. The research suggests that um, you have more enduring learning over the long term. So um, generative learning, it's a theory, it's the, you know, which will come as no surprise, um, that involves the active integration of the learner's existing experiences and knowledges, or to use cognitive psychology terms, schemata and the way in which they actively integrate the new ideas. So the main idea of generative learning is that in order to learn with understanding, a learner has to construct the meaning actively. So instead of showing you how to do pages right away, we invited you to go out and have a look, give it a go. <clears throat> um, and it is a little bit more messy and a little bit more frustrating the research does suggest that in the long term, learners will have um, a stronger sense of that learning and how to apply it in the long term. I mean, if you think of it in neuropsych terms, it's like long term potentiation. You know, even if your learners retrieve just a partial piece of information, and even if that information is correct, it's actually going to enhance learning in the long term because the information is being encoded in their own existing experiences. Um, so <clears throat> if we take a social cultural approach, the learners bring their experiences and knowledges to bear in the classroom. So any way that you prime those knowledges and experiences is going to lead to more enjoying learning or you're activating specific cognitive processing. Uh, right? You cannot separate individuals' life histories from, any, from new content. And that's true for you as instructors as well. And I think in graduate courses, that notion of what your learners are already bringing, what they may not understand, and getting them to share their knowledges and experiences is not only important for community building, but it's also priming for long-term learning. <clears throat> so they will find it um, more stressful, it'll feel messier, um, but I think encouraging people to share what they know as well. So, for example, um, it is true. <laughs> it was funny in one lecture once I was having trouble with volume. Who knew? And a student was shouting out at me what to do, which was really helpful, slightly disconcerting. And in the end, they just came down and were seeing to it. I didn't particularly like being shouted at, but it was cool because obviously the individual wanted to help they had the knowledge um, and that they also were taking some ownership anyways i waffle but so the other part of this 
comes from the learning scientists. They have a great website with lots of information. Um, but one of the things they talk about is dual coding. So often what happens is, um, is we will put text on a PowerPoint and then we will speak to it. So you have interference, you're trying to read what I'm saying and I'm not saying exactly what's there, um, but you're not using another modality. So I use images a lot. Um, so here I have a lovely red brick wall with um, plants cascading over and it's my metaphor and analogy for generative learning. Um, so some people who work really well with metaphor and analogy, it just supports their learning in different ways. And again, it's supported more by the research that the more you use images or ask students to construct images in relation to text is important. We know that we tend to privilege text. Um, we know that we tend to privilege linearity and particular kinds of structures. Um, but the unintended consequence of that can often be is that um, students believe there is one answer, especially we've all been socialized into picking the right answer. So especially if we're having seminars where we want people to explore and engage, um, sometimes using a generative approach will um, support. Anyway, um, often if you read about this, there's two other concepts and I'll just say them briefly. You may already know them. So desirable difficulties. Um, the one thing I just want to say about desirable difficulties is it's related to design for learning and it's desirable difficulties and are not related to designing difficult course content. Those two often get conflated. And the other notion of fluency. I think it's really important to find out what people want, um, what they know. But uh, fluency is that notion that often people confuse familiarity with learning. So you see something, I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that, right? I always use the example of a regression. I know what regression does, and I would answer yes. But if you asked me, can I construct a regression equation? I would look down and avoid all eye contact. Anyway, um, so just that notion that one of the strategies we were using was this notion of generative learning to get people to go out and try before you actually share the content with them. And I think that can be really helpful, not only in undergrad, but graduate courses. So that's what we were doing with pages. Not only did we want you to share um, information about yourself in a safer way as possible to support community building, but it also supports learning. So supporting learners to make meaning within the context of their existing experiences. It's tricky, right? Because we know violence is often perpetrated through dehumanizing. Um, so we want to humanize, but not put students at risk. Anyway, pages was one way to start. Um, and thank you for listening. And thank you all for supporting um, and going in last week and exploring and adding. And I'm going to pass over to Natalie and look at your questions. Uh, we just had a couple of hands up, so we'll maybe address this first. Uh, so Asma, I think you had your hand up and then Abru. All right, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Leanne or I don't know, Natalie, whoever and, and people who are probably more experienced with using pages can help me with this. I really like the idea because I am, I believe that it's not just me communicating with the students and then they communicating with me for their learning, but it's the interaction among students which contributes to immense learning in the classroom. And so I like the idea theoretically. What I noticed was that one could go ahead and edit other people's pages. So I, when I visited other people's pages, I was able to, I didn't try this, but I saw signs of editing which I assumed mean that I can go ahead and let's say edit Ebru's content. Um, I wonder how, what are how do how do how do you and I'm, I'm not saying that students would like to edit other people's stuff, but what if people go ahead and um, 
edit some for someone else's stuff. So mm -hmm. have you had instances like that, or how how do you go around and maybe not allow people to do that? Yeah. So you're all um, assigned instructor status in this Sakai site, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, my peers. If you assign people as students, they can't edit each other's. But I think it still raises the point that you want to frame the ways that people interact with the information, that they need to be respectful. This is how people want to share. But yeah, I think it's um, the assignment of student or instructor status. OK. So Julia just said in the chat there, students can't edit each other's. Yeah, just to confirm. Sorry, okay. jumping in. Yeah. No, thank you. It's um, so you're giving you're getting the experience of what it'd be like for instructors. So you could modify a students, but the students can't change each other's. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure that, like Nian said, it's supposed to be a safe space for them to share their personal stories. And um, so in order for that environment to be really felt safe, it, it, I, to me, it felt important that uh, they can actually think that they are the only ones who can add or. Right, thanks. And then I think I brew had a comment. Oh, nice to see your face. Hello, everyone. Um, Leanne, Natalie, it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, I was wondering, Leanne, if I can understand fluency, and I really appreciate when you say that people confuse familiarity with learning. I think that's a common mistake that we do when we teach, right? Because we assume that, um, especially at the upper level courses or grad courses, um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about desirable difficulty. Yeah. What, and I'm going to thank you. I hope everyone hangs in there. <laughs> um, so usually desirable difficulties, fluency and generative learning all get spoken about together again. So not to reduce any one of these two neuropsych or cognitive processes, but the idea that learning actually requires some effort for it to be enduring. So the desirable difficulty is the, the most common example is self-testing. Am I be, could I reproduce an answer to this question? Or even better in terms of generative learning, the desirable difficulty is, could I generate an exam question and then answer that question. So really desirable difficulty is the notion that learning is, it can be a little bit challenging. You have to put some effort in as a learner to have that learning be cemented so that you can transfer it to other situations and use it in the long term. So if I just read over my notes, I go, oh yeah, I know that but there's no difficulty there. So um, I think that's the piece with generative. People are like, no, just tell me what the answer is. Instead of I'm prompting or you're prompting your students to think about, we had this reading, this is the main idea, but then how does it connect to this larger body? So the difficulty is say maybe instead of reproducing something is how do these two big concepts relate and normally students will say I'm not sure and then they wait for you to tell them but I think giving them a bit more of that time for them to generate it themselves fits more with desirable difficulties the problem is is that sometimes people confuse that with testing or the course design pushes that learning too far beyond people's um, abilities so it's about thinking about their learning and the ways that students can engage in it and saying to them, this might feel a little bit challenging or difficult, but we're going to work through it together. That's the whole point of having discussion. Um, so yeah, you, I'll, I can find you more information. Um, there's lots on desirable difficulties, but 
it's not really an astounding concept. <laughs> Um, but it's no, very I, much related to generative um, and fluency. I appreciate you offering to help, but I can Google it and then find information. Don't do stuff for me. I can find it. It sounds interesting the way that difficulty is attached to desirability. Uh, but thank you. You're welcome. So, Natalie, can I pass to you? You can. So I'm just going to try to. There we go. Um, so if we sorry, I apologize. My computer didn't look like it was sharing its screen, but I think it is. So let me know if it's not. Um, so uh, Abra brought up the, the wonderful point last uh, session around the importance of thinking about teaching and learning in our current experience and what's happening uh, in the world around us. And so I came across um, this tweet the other day and I really liked the way um, it framed this notion that we are all in some way in the same storm, this collective trauma together, but we're certainly not all in the same boat and that some folks are facing um, storms on top of storms and some of us might be facing that um, certainly as well. And so I just wanted to offer a bit of an opportunity to think about and to have a discussion about the ways that that is impacting or informing um, your current teaching, if you're teaching now, the planning as we move through fall, um, and those sorts of things um, in order to think about the ways that trauma-informed pedagogy can can really help us facilitate high quality teaching and learning as we move forward. Um, so would anyone, I'm just sort of putting it out for, for discussion there. So if anyone is uh, willing to comment on the ways that this might be impacting or informing their planning or their teaching currently. So yeah. it's so for me, I think with the the classes that I've been doing, it's a lot about being flexible in terms of um, the deadlines because some of the people, especially in uh, my course right now, are healthcare providers or uh, public health professionals. So being very flexible and thinking about how they're able to um, engage with this given their own situation uh, in their lives. Yeah, and I think um, I'm, I'm just wrapping up uh, teaching a graduate course as well. And that really came to the forefront in my own recent term as well. Um, I see Ibru's hand is up. Is it up again, Ibru? Sorry, I'm not sure. I don't want to put you on the spot. It, it is not up. OK, sorry. <laughs> um, and sorry, so I try to navigate multiple things. Um, and so I see Sora Asma's hand is up. I, I would like to take this great opportunity because some of you have taught the, this first term given these uh, you know unprecedented circumstances. I would and I, as I plan my graduate course for fall, one of the this, one of the debates in my mind that I'm having is that work, what works best? Uh, is it a synchronous mode of communication that works best or is it synchronous mode of communication that works best? And I can think of positives and negatives for both sides, but what have you done in this term? Um, if you could speak to that, that would be wonderful. So I can give you a little bit of an overview and I think it's uh, really come to fruition in the last little while. So everything that I've created is very much asynchronous, except um, I've, uh, I've done weekly updates and I send uh, weekly emails about what to expect or this lesson is open or this is, you know, assignments have been graded or reflections that I have, I'm have i having that week. I also stay really on top of the forums and provide feedback. And I think the other piece that has been really important, although it's asynchronous, 
is providing them with the opportunity to meet with me face to face any like and we can set up a time to do that in teams i didn't want to go the synchronous luxury like show up and you have to listen to me talk because i don't think it's effective at this point um i'm kind of struggling thinking going into the 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 term um in the fall, I have a fourth year class, very high functioning class. So similar, uh, I would say to a first year graduate course and uh, wanting to kind of be able to be present. So I'm trying to figure out what that might look like if it is just getting together with smaller groups. So I have a class of 20 and just, you know, every other week meeting with five students and just to have that bit of face to face and, and discussion time. Um, but again, I think there's there's pros and cons to all of that. But I also think in a graduate course, a really great opportunity is to actually ask your students what they think they'd really like and being I know it might sound like, oh, then I have to like change the way I am. But, you know, giving them a few options is like, do you want to see me once a week for 30 minutes or do you want to just have touch base every two weeks? And what does that look like? So I think that flexibility being built in is really important. And sorry, I'm kind of going off on tangents, but I've been thinking about this a lot lately. <laughs> no, that's, that's certainly you. helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, and sorry, Linda's hand. Yeah, I just I haven't taught, but I've got a colleague who's currently teaching a graduate course and he's done everything asynchronous. It's all posted, but he uses the regular class time. He's broken down into small groups. So in a three hour schedule, he takes like so seven for an hour and seven for an hour and seven for an hour to do the synchronous. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, that strategy. Uh, does anyone else have any sort of strategies or, or questions or thoughts on this? Alrighty. So uh, I'm just going to skip ahead a few. Just being aware of the time to make sure that we leave enough time for Madeline and Julie to share their wonderful strategies. Um, this image here is is a uh, is from the social school of social work at the University of Buffalo, um, and it speaks to the sort of um, five main components of uh, of trauma informed care. And so um, I just share that because it, it connects well with the slides that follow. That um, I'm absolutely not going to take credit for because uh, they're Julia's. Um, so thanks, Julia. Um, but if we're designing with trauma informed sort of practice in mind, um, there's a there's a few things that we can do to to really um, plan and deliver our course materials and our, our relationships and our, our connections with students. Um, and the first of those is sort of predictability, right? So even if we're delivering materials in an asynchronous fashion or predominantly asynchronous fashion, um, we still want to make sure that students have a sense of what a schedule for a week could look like. So if, uh, as Madeline mentioned, you know, you're sending a weekly email uh, or if you're releasing something on a, a, a specific schedule, um, allowing students to have that predictability so that they sort of know what's coming, but also being really flexible and ensuring that there is opportunities for folks to engage um, regardless of sort of where they're at. So um, you release a, a lesson or a module or something on Monday, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of that content needs to be gone through on Monday. Um, or if something comes up and a due date is, um, you know, approaching quickly um, and a student reaches out, is there a way to be flexible with those sorts of things? Um, and uh, Asma brought up this great point of, you know, how are you being present, right? And, and Madeline too, how are we fostering relationships? And we want to really work um, towards making those connections and to, to creating relationships and community uh, with our students and also amongst students as well. Um, and then also empowerment, so making things meaningful to students and allowing them to have some control over the course. So in what ways can a course be structured and delivered that really allows for students to integrate that content and integrate that knowledge and that learning um, into their lives and into their sort of their scholarship and their learning and their practice moving forward. And so if we think through these sort of four things around designing with trauma-informed practice in mind, I wondered if we might sort of um, 
brainstorm what that might look like or share some ideas around what that might look like. And we've got some good ideas um, that have already been shared, but I'm wondering if um, there might be any um, new ideas that folks have, have been thinking about while I've been um, carrying on. Also, while you think I want to say that they're Madeline slides, I don't want to take credit oh, sorry. for them. That's okay. <laughs> that, that they're really well put together for the fourth year class, but that we've used them in all of them because I think it's so relevant in all, in every single course. Um, and you know, so in particular right now for grad uh, graduate courses. So um, I just gave you some thinking space so that now people can jump in and and say how they're thinking they might use that. I'd love to hear. Uh, I see Asma's hand, so hop on. Uh, feel free to unmute. So sorry, I don't want to kind of uh, monopolize, but, but but I really want to say that the piece around flexibility is something that I had not necessarily thought about, and I now realize how important this is, uh, and how I have even asked for flexibility of my reviewers or editors to kind of uh, allow me some extra time because managing things at home has not been as easy as it could be at, let's say, a work workplace like Brock University. So in terms of building flexibility in my um, in my and I'm thinking, how can I bring this in my course outline? I can probably add a line saying, if the the pandemic is affecting you in timely submission of your assignments, please inform me beforehand, so that people are aware that I am willing and flexible, but also kind of maintaining a certain discipline, which probably an MBA class expects. So, yeah, I I I'm I'm happy that I was able to actually think about flexibility. Thanks. And I think that's important. And I will admit that this semester I had a week where I could not get my lesson done uh, to release at the moment that I wanted to. And so I, I use that as an opportunity to say to the students, I'm like, I understand that some of you need some flexibility in this time. And I just said, I need your flexibility here too. So really like, you know, that's a relationship piece as well. And they're connecting. And, you know, I, I said, I could give you a million excuses, but this is just what's happened in my life. And I hope you understand. And a few students actually emailed me and were like, we hope you're okay. And, you know, don't worry about it. We'll do it tomorrow. So I was like, oh, that was really nice. But it, it created that meaningful connection, but also flexibility for them, so. I also, I also, heard, I also heard, I think I saw it online, um, the sewing online is just like I heard it these, day, these days, um, in terms of flexibility to give them options in terms of assignments, uh, don't stick with one assignment or multiple assignments. So if there's like, a, I generally have the tendency to give multiple assignments, but even for that, the recommendation was just like, make sure that they can choose whatever they want in terms of the different deadlines. So they actually create their own outline um, within the course, which I'm hoping to do with the grad course, rather than telling them this is what it is, but to provide in quotation flexibility in terms of the, the assignments they would like to choose. Um, and the submission deadlines that will work for them and for their families. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really and and we see really quickly how all of these concepts are really um, sort of relational with one another too, right? So the flexibility that you provide students is likely to be reciprocated through that positive relationship when we reach out. Um, and have connections across them. And when we empower them, as you're talking, Ibru, um, through making those choices in terms of constructing their own sort of outline um, is a really, um, it's a really powerful approach. So I just wanted to offer the opportunity for anyone else to share before I can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, so on this slide here, we have um, just some ideas. Um, and some of these, of course, have, you know, are connected with some of the ideas that we've had. So um, around predictability, you know, you're having, if you're going to do quizzes or if you're having um, assignments that are due each month, just letting students know through these clear guidance um, and providing examples and instructors, 
structured uh, times for submissions and those sorts of things, but also being flexible, right? Um, and so understanding about, you know, extensions, uh, does it does it matter when it comes in? Um, and thinking through sometimes why it might matter, because in some instances um, it might, and in other instances it might not. Um, and so those sorts of connections. Um, and so keeping this connection open, an example there would be, you know, is there an opportunity for this collaboration um, through discussions via forms or synchronous seminars or student pages? You know, what are the opportunities for a connection um, and how can they help us build in this way? Um, and then this empowerment piece, and I think uh, Abra's example is a really wonderful one. You know, 80% of the grade is created, but for 20%, um, you know, students might have the opportunity to build in this choice, um, not only of when the assignment might be submitted, but what the assignment actually is. So I really thank you for um, for sharing that, Abru. Um, and we can certainly carry on this conversation around um, developing um, in a really trauma-informed way in the forms um, in our Sakai site if we would like uh, moving forward. But I'm just aware of time, and so I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides um, but there's some great information here around humanizing um, in online learning um, in order to just be able to sort of throw it to um, Julia um, and Madeline to share some strategies. OK, yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I might go back. Actually, does it does it go back for me or just for you? <laughs> I think I'm taking control. Um, I think I might just uh, talk a little bit about this this piece um, about um, your presence and how you can use the forums to create this this space and how it can be an opportunity for you to connect with your students. So then jumping forward to the forums, um, you can um, set them up if in the grad classes, you don't need to um, put them in smaller groups because it might already be in smaller groups, but you have that opportunity. If you wanted them to work in even smaller groups, they can do um, groups of four or five um, and have uh, maybe richer, deeper conversations um, that way. And so the, here's a, like a really large group that was broken up, but you could even do it with small groups into even smaller groups. And Sakai gives that, that functionality for you. Um, and here's an example of um, um, again, this is a, a larger group showing a smaller group, but you could set up um, like these question prompts that can kind of get at um, what the core learning is for each of the weeks. And then you can be um, guiding the conversations, but you can also be there for them to um, encourage them to connect with each other and have really rich conversations um, as, as you're creating this community of inquiry. Um, this is uh, this is kind of I talk about this as uh, automation for good. Uh, there's a lot of bad things that um, uh, um, artificial intelligence could do, but uh, just sort of um, a, a, it does let you know and kind of identify early um, how how people are accessing the site. Uh, I always like to let students know that I do have that ability if I turn on the statistics that I can see what's happening, but it is a good, it gives you a good overview of who is coming into the site and doing things. And so um, some people are just sort of quietly working away on their own and that's great. That's their way of, of, it, of, um, of getting at the learning, but perhaps they're not coming in. And so just knowing that they're not there allows you to do some early intervention and you can reach out. So for example, this just this week, it's the ad drop date for my course. Um, and so, uh, you know, I gave her a week's notice. I said somebody wasn't really, hadn't done much and I knew she was busy. So I just wanted to make sure that she's okay. I know this, I noticed you haven't been into the site. Is everything all right? And things weren't all right. And I was like, that's okay. I can work with you and we can work through on how to get you through this course. So because I was able to make, do that reach out, she didn't feel like she was just left adrift and, and gave up. I was like, no, I'm here to support you um, so you can be successful. So sometimes the um, these automated um, features, which can be really dehumanizing, can actually allow you to have a very humanizing touch. Um, also, um, they can allow for places for group work, um, which is can be very visual uh, and visualized. So you can see um, the activity that's going on when people are working in their group so they can um, make that stuff uh, available. Um, okay, this is uh, back to somebody else. 
<laughs> <laughs> so over to me. So uh, we wanted a, a number of people said, how do we um, help this help students in these grad courses work together? And so this is a strategy that I've been using uh, this summer. Uh, it's in teams. And so I have created a team for, for my course. And then from there, I created everybody's in the general so they can see any kind of messages or something. I have I don't really post in there. I use Sakai for everything, but this is where they're doing their group work. And so you can make a group that is underneath that in in that team and it's locked and you just have to add students into it. So I added my students and you can kind of see it where it says Madeline Law has added and da 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 da. And so I put a message and I said, here's where you can work together on your document. You can, they can actually, if we go to the next slide there, um, you can think, yeah, there you go. Uh, so here, what I did is I just said, this is where you can work. I gave them instructions in the file. I put how to do a, a big chat, like a step-by-step -step how to engage because the topic was, they have to take a theory from the class, research it, uh, apply it to a healthcare or a public health issue, then they have to do a collaborative presentation and videotape it. So similar to what we're doing here, that's what my students will be doing and they have to do it collaboratively. So this is a space that allows them to actually video conference each other. And I was just looking at it and I could see I'm in each one of the groups with the students. And in there they said, hey, does everybody wanna meet here on Monday at 10 o'clock and we can chat. And so they can video call each other. They can put stuff in the chat. They can also work on, um, I think you can see it there on the next slide. They can work on the PowerPoint presentation right in there. And then they can also call me in. So if they were working on something and they said, okay, we're gonna work on something from 10 to 11. And then uh, we've set up a meeting with the Dr. Law at 11. They can just call me right into this session and I can be part of this and I can give them feedback and discuss the topic and maybe you know throw a few links in there. So it's that collaborative space that uh, groups can come together and design their presentations, have collaborative discussions and actually meetings within their own uh, their own group within the course. So it's working, it seems to be working really well already. The students are using it. The, the topic or the assignment isn't due until the end of July. So once that comes in, I'll let you know how it goes. Um, but we also have a step-by-step -step instructions on how to set this up as well as how to um, make the groups and have the students uh, put together this presentation, record it and upload it into assignments in Sakai. So if you're interested in that document, we're more than happy to provide it for you. So that's, I think, the end of the slide. So Natalie, I'll throw it back to you to kind of wrap it up. Sure, thank you. Um, I think that we perhaps wanted to, um, Leanne, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we wanted to maybe go into Sakai um, and take a look at few, a few of the pages, apologies, stumbling over my words. Um, and I can show you, I actually created um, a couple of videos that Leanne's referencing in the chat. So let me just head over to Sakai. Excuse me. Oops, I did the wrong thing, sorry. Here we go. Um, so this is our graduate classes site. Um, I hope everyone can see it. So I created a couple of, of new video resources and they're available in the overview page as well as in this resources uh, page. Um, and so it's a, just a short video on how, when, why you might want to use student pages in Sakai in your own course. And then the second video um, you can share with your students to support them as they develop their own pages. Um, because it's an echo, um, in order to share it with you, you can embed it directly in your course by, by sort of copying and pasting um, this embed code, or um, you can send folks this share link and they can look at it um, in their web browser as well. Um, but just so that you're fully like that you're aware that those are available um, and those should be captioned shortly as well, just so that um, everyone knows. Um, but Leanne, did you want to take a look at the student pages? Well, not student, but uh, at, at the pages that folks made for this. Yeah, <clears throat> if um, Linda gave us permission to have a look at hers and I just wondered if people could just talk about their experiences. Um, 
just so that you can learn from each other and see what each other are doing. And uh, Maya, you transferred yours over from an existing Sakai site. So you might just share with other people um, what you've been doing. But yeah, let's have a look at Linda's. And again, this notion is um, we're going to look at. Sorry, I thought I was still muted for a second. I had a panic. Um, so I would just like to say that Linda's kindly said, yes, we can look at hers. So we're looking at it to think about what might work for our own pages. Um, how might you come to know Linda a little bit more fully by looking at what she's done here already? Um, so yeah. Now, if Linda had just said in text, I'm interested in dolls, I would not have had such a full understanding that this is not just, oh yeah, I like them, but there's something um, I would say a little bit, uh, I've come to understand more by seeing this um, picture. So if we could start, it says, so I thought I would be able to add a checklist here. Um, so how would we add the checklist? So checklists are part of lessons and they're not part of student content. So when you're designing oh. a, a, a lesson for your course as an instructor, you would put the checklist for your students. But as a student, you wouldn't put a checklist for other students because there's no other content. You're really basically, it's just a web page you're building. You're not linking it to any kind of activities or assessments. Oh, thank you. So we could, um, if we return back to this sort of um, opening lessons page, we could add a checklist here and it might outline what you would like students to share uh, within their student page. Um, and students could be like, okay, I've, I've, you know, I've shared my name, I've shared an image or a video or something of that nature, but we would add it here, but students couldn't add it. And because everybody's an instructor in this course, everybody could actually add a checklist to this top page, but it wouldn't be inside your student page that you would do it. How was the process for you, Linda? Uh, well, it was interesting. I spent a lot of time, if you, you see those pictures, it seems to me like I ought to be able to size them because they're way too big. Um, and I went online to try to like, you can click on them to edit and it shows you can size them, but it doesn't seem to work for me anyway. So I still haven't figured that out. Um, it's intriguing. I must say like you, you, you wonder how much to share. Like I agree with you. I think the, the reason I posted the picture of the dolls was just what you're saying. Like you, you don't really understand what I mean when I say I'm interested in dolls till you see that insanity, which is about half of them. Uh, but the, the second thing, and I didn't caption it right, I'm also a Christmas fanatic. So that was why those backyard pictures are there. But I just said, this is the backyard. So again, it's like, well, wait a minute, that ah. doesn't really communicate, right? Because then I was going to post a video of my Christmas village, which then I got messed up. It turned out for me, the video thing on how to create and save an upload was more a computer problem than a Sakai problem. So mm. there's a ton of experimentation is what my reaction is, that, that there has to be that kind of place that we can go. Like, can we create a let's pretend site? Like, if yes. this is a pretend class that I'm going to try to create this stuff on? Yes. So you can um, request a site, but you can re request a site for your course and not have it published yet. So oh, I see. you could build it, but I think it's a really important point and it's something that I can lose a lot of time over. If it doesn't look the way I want, I would have spent forever trying to size the pictures. Instead well, I give of up quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so I think just going in and trying things out. So you can request a site from the front of the Sakai page um, and you just want to make sure that it's not published. Oh, OK. Also, if you don't want to connect it to your course site at all, you can make it a project site. So there's the two types of sites. 
So you could have a course site, which is linked to your course, or you can just have a project site and they're essentially the same, except a course site, you have the ability to add your class roster. I know you're not teaching till January, so you might not see that available even yet anyway. So I would start with a project site and then it's like a sandbox, play away. Yeah, thanks. And there's so many people in CPI that know how to do so many things and are happy to help. Um, and there is some documentation that can also be shared with you. So I think it's that balance between playing and not losing a lot of time on maybe design that's not uh, directly related to designing the course. So right. as I say, for me with the pictures, I would have spent a lot of time. But thank you for sharing that. Anybody else want to say something about um, their experience or do you want to ask a quick question of each other before we run out of time here about how to do something or Maya thank you I have a question about uh, how you are going to put into the pictures like photos like this um, I try to use the add text uh, function and then there is lots of uh, uh, icons on top of that uh, row. So I try to click the images and then try to uh, include my uh, pictures into this text box, but it didn't really work. So I that's why I created another box and then use the embedded uh, functions to put the pictures um, and videos. Uh, is there any way we can use this add text to put pictures or videos from this this site, this this box? So um, I could let anybody answer, but I guess I'll just jump in. Yes, you can. So there's a new feature that just happened where you can actually paste pictures now. Um, that just happened uh, miraculously in the last little while. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the video is through that embed echo button, which uh, I'm not sure you've seen it, but I oh, can. Yeah, the um, blue yes, one. yes. The, blue, the blue one, that's where you can do the video. And yes. so that's if you've done if you've done a voiceover powerful point or any kind of video that you have anywhere, you can use that button. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So then if you go perfect, thank you. Um, and so you, that's the embed echo. I wouldn't use that um, insert picture icon because it wants to find it on the web somewhere. Oh, okay. If you want to put a picture in, but if you have it somewhere like in a Word document, it now can take a paste, which is mind blowing to me. But another really easy way to do it, if you cancel out of this, um, Natalie, the, the great thing about lessons is that if you go to add content, it lets you do, um, yeah, um, you can do an embed content on page and then you just like locate your file and you can upload that picture that way as well. So there's, okay. so that's not through the add text. It's just its own file that you can do it. You, you and, have to create separate works. Yeah, and that yeah. video on lessons is actually really helpful. Um, and mm -hmm. I think Natalie's video, um, I haven't watched it yet, but I assume it has some of those uh, features as well, right, Natalie? It does, yes. Yes. Um, although I did forget to mention the paste thing, so I might need to revise well, because it's I brand it's new. So it's new. brand new. It's so exciting. <laughs> I know. So yes. amazing. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I was going to um, actually sort of jump in if we don't mind in that when we um, if you're thinking about using student pages for like an assignment or a, an assessment um, as much as we sort of need a place to play using it for this introductory purpose is also a nice sort of lower stakes way to allow students to get some experience with it as well before we ask them to use it for an assessment purpose um, just as a, a comment. Yeah, I like that idea of that, you know, students can try it and then they then it gets used as an assessment. So um, before we go, do you just want to say maybe, you know, quickly how you might use it as an assessment? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking, um, you know, if you want to have students curate some information or some resources um, in order to lead 
you know, a session or a discussion um, on a specific topic or theme, um, that might be a place where they do that. And so allowing them the opportunity to play around with it um, first through an introduction or something of that nature um, just reduces some of the anxiety around using it um, in a in a higher stakes way as an as a, yeah. an assignment later on. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know about all of you, but I think we're out of time, aren't we? So um, we really hope that this is helpful. Um, if there's other things you'd like us to talk about next time, please put it in the chat or let any one of us know. And again, please do not hesitate to contact any of us if you want to do specific things within the Sakai site or go in there and play. And if you want to share it with the group next week, that would be wonderful um, because sometimes people use things in very different ways and it's like, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> so um, do I have a hand up here. Maya, were you wanting to say something again before we go? Sorry, oh, I forgot to raise. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I hope everybody's OK. So we'll stay here for um, a couple more minutes. If anybody's got any comments, questions or concerns, but please let us know what you'd like us to focus on next time. And other than that, have a lovely week. Just a quick technical question.